Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Right Time, a Wave Sports and Entertainment original presented by Prize Picks. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening wherever you get your podcast. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Subscribe, like, rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars, I'm inclined to believe. You are a hater. And thanks to everyone here at Austin at South by Southwest joining us. Sean, sitting here actually with me on the camera this time. Yeah, we uh, we do the show remotely. Bo's in New York. I'm in L.A. So this is a very special, uh, I think, moment. But also, you know, thanks to all the people at Sportico for the hospitality. And we're just excited to be here. Yeah, and Sean's here for like the 48 hours of my life that I have felt older than I have ever felt. The, the most recent part of feeling older than I've ever felt, we go to dinner last night. Like, you got to understand, man. I'm not saying this as a flex. It's just an understanding of who I am. I graduated from high school when I was 16. I graduated from college when I was 20. Like, I'd been like the young person everywhere I went. We went to dinner last night. It was six people there. And not only was I the third tallest, <laughs> I was the, not just, how was I, four years older than everybody? Yeah. There was a lot of 39s and then, and then you. Why you say it like that? Oh, well, I was the youngest, so I was just I was just drifting off into the shadows. No, but it was everywhere. Like it was at it was to the point where I was really having to make the, like ask the question of myself of can I afford to make this reference and will anybody know what it is that I'm talking about? The when you found out you were the oldest, the wind in your sails kind of just disappeared. Well, yeah, and then it got worse because y'all just kept talking about it. <laughs> like it then it, it then became the subject was the fact that I'm the the oldest person, and again. By a good four years over every single person that was there. That's a full high school or college term. Yes. You know? And this is after I spent far too much of a day on the Internet arguing with people about Jordan and LeBron. And I don't think I've been called an old blank more in my life. Whatever you want to put in the blank about how old apparently I am. You start arguing with people from the Generation Z about LeBron James and Michael Jordan. And the only choice you have is to become an old person. I never feel older than when I have that conversation. If the audience isn't familiar, uh, a lot of Gen Zers on TikTok have been calling out Jordan for not having a left hand. Um, this, and they've been showing footage from the 80s, 90s of Jordan not dribbling with his left. Right, but I tried to, like, it was actually interesting. And I think, like, it, it's, it's important as, like, a, a, a look into the discourse and the way that we have things. Because I felt like I was trying to make a fairly reasonable point to the people. And the people just thought that I was old, right? And so I'm going to ask you to hear me out. My good buddy Nick Wright, who works at Fox Sports, I, I mean, he's not on the payroll with LeBron and them, but I feel like he should be, right? Like, if you know anything about it, you understand. My buddy Nick rides real hard for LeBron. I... I don't think he rides that hard for me, and his daughter loves me. But LeBron, no, nah, ain't nobody. He's riding extra hard on that program. And so, what I love about Nick is that he has the brilliant ability to craft a case behind whatever it is that he's talking about. Like, I imagine he was probably really, really good at debating in high school, right? Like, whatever you throw out there, I don't know if anybody can mount the logical argument and then perform some of the intellectual sleight of hand to trick you and to think of some stuff that's not really the case if it comes down to it. But from the beginning, we're gonna start from a logical foundation. And it's based on all these various statistics. And when you're talking about LeBron, like you have a data set that's gonna give you a number that's gonna be incredible no matter what, because nobody's been able to stack up, like other than Will Chamberlain, but Will Chamberlain didn't play for 20, 21 years, right? So nobody's been able to stack up all this stuff like LeBron has. And so, you can come out and you can make the case and you can break LeBron down to his component parts and you can say all these things that you think are better than Jordan and you can make the point that you think that this particular era has a greater level of competition. Like all of these things that make perfect sense. And all I'm trying to say is we were there, right? This is not to say that you little youngsters don't have no point because you were not there. I'm just telling you, if you are going to try to make this argument, you just going to have to settle for the fact that you're right. You see what I'm saying? Like, if you think that you are correct, 
You are just going to have to be satisfied with the fact that you're correct. You're not going to get me to believe that you are right. You're not going to come out here and with your goddamn PowerPoint presentation and a laser pointer and start bringing all this stuff up and down. You could break out some sigmas. You could break out some deltas. You could break out all the Greek letters, the mu, to try to make this point and try to show me that no matter how you slice it, what frequency distribution or whatever performance that it was, that LeBron is better than Michael Jordan. You can go ahead and do all that. The problem is, dog, I was there. Like, we saw what it was. We saw what it looked like. It ain't this, right? It's just not. And you can think that that is incorrect, and you are welcome to do it. You just gonna have to be happy that you are right. That's it. Like, I feel like that's a lesson that so many of us can learn at various points. Because so much of the time, we, man, we just on the internet arguing about a bunch of bullshit, right? Like, we just talk about such stuff that doesn't actually matter. And we get charged up. Like, we really, really get into it. And maybe if we could just say to ourselves very simply, I'm just going to have to be satisfied that I'm right. Because I'm going to be honest. I do that with y'all all the time. I had to look on the internet, Sean, over the last couple of days. But I kept fighting it, right? Like, I turned off the replies because I don't. My buddy Wright Thompson, who works for ESPN, made a very good point about Twitter before he left. And he was just like, why am I walking around with this thing in my pocket that gives you permission to motherfuck me? <laughs> right? Like, you got to really think about that when you're in a position of visibility. Like, social media is great when you, for a lack of a better term, because I don't want to sound classy and snobby, but for lack of a better term, if you are a regular person, rank and file, a member of the proletariat, perhaps, right? If we say it in these sorts of terms, then you can feel better about it and feel like you're part of something that matters. So if you are a member of the proletariat, social media gives you access to people that you kind of can't believe that you got access to, right? Like it, it makes the world smaller and brings these people that seem so far away it brings you right up close to them, which I'm sure is cool for the proletariat. I don't know what it does for them people. Like the, the, the benefit that you get, so what's happened? Dude, I can meet more strangers than I ever have in my life and they can say whatever they want to me. This is not a beneficial thing anybody wants to have in their lives, right? It doesn't do anything good for you. So I had turned off all the replies because I, I don't really care what y'all think. Like, we have to understand, this is a relationship that is more somebody's looking at me like that was the rudest thing I ever said. <laughs> um, but we have to acknowledge at times that this is a relationship based on a hierarchy, and the hierarchy is, y'all are here to see me talk, and if one of y'all comes up here to talk, I'm out. <laughs> I'm not going to hear the first word that you say by the time you get up here. I'm going to hope security stops you by the time they get right there. This is the nature of the relationship that we have. So, no, I don't want to hear your reply. It is not a matter of being soft. It's not a matter of being delicate. It is just full-on indifference and ambivalence. I'm not that curious what you think about this stuff, right? That's why, I mean, I'm just not. But, so I turn it off. I'm not going to pay no attention. But see, when you turn it off, you can still do that quote tweet on top of it. And so I get in there looking at that, and now I can't help it, right? Now y'all's badass kids is online calling me all kinds of names, right? Throwing all this stuff out here, telling me I done got old, telling me I'm stupid. And you got to understand, man, today I got retweeted by a cabinet member from the Trump administration, and it was a compliment. Like, my mind is completely upside down about what the world is. But with the Jordan LeBron thing, why it's, I guess it's fun is because it's never ending and it's cyclical and everything else. But how we have decided that we all have to be right about it. That's the part that I don't get. Kashawn, you went like about 32 now. Yep. You got an opinion on this? I don't want to say, I don't know if I want to say it in front has, of an he clearly, audience. He clearly has an opinion on this. That is, I, I, did I put my producer on the spot in a situation that was unfair? That's 100% correct. That was what I did. I didn't realize I was doing it until halfway through. Well, I mean, it's funny because we had a conversation about this at lunch. Mm -hmm. And the conversation, I think, were between three like-minded people who understand basketball. But, you know, for me, when I'm on TikTok and I do see clips of Jordan struggling to finish with his left hand it just makes me think a little more wow that's it's so wild you boil down 15 years to a goddamn tiktok that that's the worst part about this is the dislike so i found this one time that michael jordan didn't do something with his left hand and now suddenly that becomes everything that has ever happened but when i talk about lebron wetting to bed in 2010 and 2011 on the biggest stages i'm bringing up the old stuff that's the part, you know, like, this is, this is the direction that it goes in. This is what I do think, like, intellectually speaking, is the most interesting thing to say about this and why 
I go on Jordan's side every time on this one. You can add up, like, this is a parallel example as I get back to it. If you listen to the Whalers, right, Peter Tosh with the legendary line that Ja did not put him on earth to be no backup singer when he decided he ain't want to be in Bob Marley's band no more. Peter Tosh is like a better voice than Bob does. He's a better guitar player than Bob was. I can list all these things. Except the problem is he's not Bob Marley. That answers everything, right? You may not be able to parse it, break it down to everything else, but in the end, the answer, what's the deal with Peter Tosh? He's cool. He's just not Bob Marley, right? The thing that Jordan had, and I feel like as we reduce sports more to numbers and make this such a quantitative endeavor that we lose sight of, there's a scene in The Last Dance that I actually think is the most interesting thing that goes on there. And the way they shot it was really interesting because I feel like I feel like in retrospect, it's a shot of Jordan playing against the Jazz. I don't know which game, but it, it looked very bright. Like the shot was very well lit. It's Jordan going in slow-mo. And I forget who the person is off camera. And he's making the point that what made Michael Jordan the greatest basketball player of all time, he said, it's not this, it's not that, it's not all these different things. It was his ability to be 100% present in the biggest moments of every game, right? And the point to that that I find to be so interesting is that, and where we lose sight of, in spite of the fact that we really fully grasp it in our society when it's time to prescribe people medicine, focus is a skill. Focus is a resource. Like the ability when something is going down that matters, to be like, I am doing this and nothing else matters. I have no fear of the consequences. I have no fear of what happens if this doesn't go right. I'm not thinking about anything else in the world than this thing that I am doing right now. Like the ability to lock in on doing something like that is the most valuable ability that there is when you're talking about any level of achievement at the highest levels and echelons of what you're doing, that you can block everything else and lock in on it. I can't think of any human being in life that has ever been as good at doing that one thing as Michael Jordan is. So if you're talking about people that are on the same level, like a similar plane, whatever you bring up is not necessarily going to be a huge insult to the person that you're not going with. We're talking about the margins. What is the thing that separates this person from that person when both of them have an incredible set of accolades, attributes, talent, skills, everything else on both sides? But in the end, what we know about that one guy is he's going to be here no matter what, right? The other guy got better at it. But this guy right here, hey, man, I seen things happen to this one guy that I know would never happen to this guy. And I ain't never seen that one guy do anything that I did not believe that this other guy could ever pull off. That's what it comes to. The way that I see it. But just like you, I'm going to have to be satisfied with being right. That's it. That's all that's going to happen. Y'all not going to bow down before me and tell me I'm right. Y'all are not going to be like, you know, the more I've been thinking about it, I've come around to your way of thinking. You're not going to do it. And even if you do, I'm not going to get no money. <laughs> you, you brought up the mentality thing at lunch and obviously again, but I think the reason why the younger generations don't see Jordan for that is because that level of focus doesn't exist today. I think that's part of it. I also think there's another part of it. Young people are assholes. Like, and, 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 I, and I've been one, right? I was there, right? I have been in that place. This is, just, this is just how it goes. This is just what it is. And then one day you're going to look up and you're the oldest person at the table and you're going to be looking at the youngsters and you're going to be telling them, that's cool, but I'm telling you, man, we were there. And there's going to be some other group of children assuming that the world ain't fried up by then. And they're going to be looking back the same way when you talk about LeBron and they talk about Big Vic from France and they saying all the same stuff. And they're going to be pulling up these clips of LeBron getting devastated in the post by J.J. Barea. Right. They're going to go back and talk about getting <laughs> swept by all these. They're going to pull out all that sort of stuff that you're trying to pull out on Michael Jordan. And they're going to go back and they're going to look at them kids and they're going to be like, all right, I hear you but we were there and it's going to matter then. And by the time they realize that it matters, unfortunately, my old ass is going to be dead. 
You're not wrong. Speaking of being there, Bo, I, you know, we're here talking about sports, sports media. You yeah. have been in the industry significantly, not to do the old thing again, but significantly longer than most people here. Um, I know you have a lot to say yeah. on that matter and we're yeah. at the Sportico track. Yeah, that, that is actually a wild realization because I am now, I have been doing this in various capacities now for 24 years, which is a, now to be clear though, I like, I came out of college or like I, I, I got started early, right? But it's still, it's 24 years. It's a legit 24 years. And I don't want to tell you this funny story though, or somewhat funny story. On the flight down, I was on the same flight with Conan O'Brien. And I don't know if he's here right now, but we should not call him Conan O'Brien. We need to call him Conan O'Brien because that's a big motherfucker right there. Like, I don't know if you have seen him. He's really, really like broad and like a couple inches taller than me. I ain't saying he diesel because I don't get the feeling that he out here doing nothing with it. But that's still a big dude, right? Like you see him on the plane and you're struck by how big a dude he is. And the reason I bring that up is all these people who went to the Super Bowl, all of the ones that walked by Cam Newton were just struck by how big of a dude Cam Newton was. If I am stopping on an airplane to say that man is Conan O'Brien, can you imagine how big Cam Newton has to be in real life? Like, just how giant this dude is. Well, Mina Kime said it that he walked by her and it yes. was a shadow. He casted a shadow. That's how big he is. We just watched a video where Cam Newton won a fight against four people without throwing a punch. Against, I, mean, I don't care... He came out later and he said that he didn't know that he was apologizing for all of it. He kind of low key was admitting that he started it right. All of those things. But the point wasn't that he started it. The point was, even if he started it, you are probably going to need to come up with a different method, method of conflict resolution. Like if you can, the reason you can't start it, as we have seen, is can't nobody fight you fair. So like the trunk is your best option. Like if, like, if it's coming, like, these, these are your choices, man. They say you got to go fight Cam Newton. You could try to swing on him, but you can lay his big ass down. Option B is really the, like, if you have to get it done, choice one is not an option. It's not going down. And that's why cats like him can't be out here fighting people because can't nobody fight him straight up. Now, of course, I know all these things and I've heard all these things about Cam because Cam does podcasts now. I am very interested in the fact that he does podcasts. I am very interested in the fact that so many athletes now are doing podcasts. I know Iman Shumper was here doing one earlier. I also feel like, given the type of event that is, and ostensibly there's people who make decisions in this and we should be thinking about our industry, we kind of got to talk about what's going on, right? Because this is, this is, we did a, uh, I did a TV show for HBO called Game Theory. And we had our last show, our last guest was Cameron. And this is his Cam had just started doing the, um, doing the YouTube show, which I thought was really good and interesting. And so I wanted to have him on the show. And I looked at him and I said, you know, when I was in college, you know, a lot of them cats wanted to get like you, right? You know, they were wearing the paint because they were trying to get like you. And I just want to know when it is that you decided you was trying to get like me. All these cats are trying to get like us. And... It's, it's almost like, like you remember when the Apple products really got to moving, right? Like when people really started getting the Macs and people like, and it was an interesting shift because you probably noticed it when like the cool people and the people who made beats started using Apple products and started telling everybody that they were using Apple products. But part of why I've always felt like Apple caught on the way it did as a brand is because it was the rare thing that the dorks were on first. And the dorks held it down and the cool kids were all then trying to be like the dorks. And so the dorks all stuck around because now they get an extra level of credibility and value for what they're doing because the cool kids are now coming on and now Apple got trillions of dollars in cash as a result of it. All right. I'm not saying that my industry is a bunch of dorks, but um, we are not the cool kids. We know this, right? The cool kids are the people that we cover. In fact, a great deal of the resentment that comes from the dynamic between the two groups has a lot to do with the fact that a lot of the people who cover sports can't live with the fact that the cool kids are the ones that we cover, that the people that we cover by and large are the ones who are better at their jobs than we are at doing our jobs. It's the truth. Now, what you wound up with in that dynamic, I believe, 
is the seeds of what became a time of much greater distrust between the media and athletes and a building time of declining access that the media had with athletes, a decline in those relationships, and it spreads farther and farther and farther apart until you get into an era that's now this era of social media, and what you then get from there is this relationship used to be symbiotic, that people in the media needed the access to the teams and to the athletes, obviously to do their jobs, and the people on the teams and the athletes or whatever needed the access, needed the relationships with the media to get out whatever information they wanted for branding, increase your fame, visibility, all of this stuff. It used to go back and forth. Well, one, you kind of started and got a level of media that didn't require access. And I say that with no judgment because I have made a lot of money in that world, right? Like, I don't need to talk. You can talk to me if you want to, but I'm going to talk about you regardless, Right. But that dynamic and people who don't like treat that with enough care, they then create a situation that leads to a lot of distrust that athletes have toward the media. Much of it is earned. On the other hand, I also think that a lot of what goes on with the media folks is, I mean, the athletes themselves is not understanding that there's still a value from a neutral arbiter, right? So you can get out here and say whatever it is that you want, but what you want to say may not even be all the things that you need to say and you may not even realize it, right? It ain't always going to look good for you, but you're probably better off opening yourself up to another level of scrutiny or somebody else, right? But that relationship gets broken. So once that relationship gets broken and you have this split, we get to where we are now where the athlete really doesn't need traditional media if the idea is to get your viewpoint across. Or certainly not if the idea is that you want to build your brand. You can go do that all by yourself. It's funny, I was flying in um, here, my buddy Dave Jacoby, uh, Jacoby or Jalen Jacoby was on the flight with me, and I hadn't really thought about it until I talked to him, but I looked around, and this is me talking, not him, but like you look at the template for all of these podcasts, and they all Jalen and Jacoby, right? You get an athlete, find a white guy if you can. <laughs> if not, you know, like, like he certainly has a friend on the payroll that can sit down and ask questions and be like a, you know, I don't know what you call these guys, right? But you understand what I'm talking about, right? That was the beginning of it. And Jalen Rose came on with all the stories and everything else. And that's a very famous person who had been through all these different things and seen all these things, a legitimate, like, cultural icon in sports. And that became what all these podcasts basically are, right? And what's interesting about that when I think about it and why I bring it up and how all of us need to think about what we're doing is, hey, man, do not underestimate the value of a professional. It is not that athletes can't make good content. It's that most of them up until this point are not professionals, right? Right. So I worked at ESPN for a very long time. And what happens when you do that is you see athletes who start off doing this new and then become professionals. Like dudes like RC, right? Like Ryan Clark, Marcus Spears, them dudes are professionals. Like they got in there, they got on that grind. Shannon Sharp is a fantastic example of it. Like a dude who was down at Fox, and my understanding was he was getting off the set wanting to watch film on what he was doing so he could get better. You understand what I mean? Like this is not at all to make the argument that an athlete can't be good at making this kind of content. However... It's a lot of people making content and it ain't all good, right? But this happens because the dudes are over there like, we don't need you. And on top of it, and I remember this, this is something Cam said uh, after that game manager controversy that he had, where he got on and he was like, look, I don't know why he went to this place, but he was talking about how football didn't use, he used football, football didn't use him. And he made an argument that, he decided to get into this media game and maybe some people have some resentment of the fact that he can do this as well as the people in the media can do this. And that is where I say skirt. <laughs> he, he can be, he's really like talent wise. He's got it. And he's really sincere and obviously got that charisma, you know, like I'm watching him deal with the media early in his career. It's like really cool to see where he has come now right because that's the thing when you see a guy and you first become aware of him when he's 21 and now you see him in his mid-30s right like I don't know the dude but it, you've watched him grow up in some ways and so it's interesting to see the space that he inhabits but this is not an easy job like Sean I can imagine how many people you've worked with athletes non-athletes and you see them realize yo this is really hard 
Yeah, I think people forget that it's like a job that people like you've worked years in radio, yeah. you've written, you know how to, you know, make thoughts sound really good. And people really think that you could just turn on a mic and be yourself and that's yeah. enough. But the thing is, a lot of people who think that are also the people that write the checks on this. Right. And so everything is so saturated right now that I don't know how anything breaks through. I've made this point like this is. We're doing this podcast here. This is, I've been doing this now for six years. Like we're going into the seventh year of it. I don't know how anything breaks through, but the model seems to be for a lot of people. What they're just trying to do is like, we're going to find a ball player. We're going to find a homeboy and we're going to get out here and we're going to talk. And I'm asking the question because I can only hear but so much of it. A, how much of it is good and B, who cares? Because what it seems to happen, and a lot of people are getting this, is like, yo, you can get somebody to write you a check, right? You can get you a startup company, get somebody to write the checks for the startup. The startup then writes checks for people. They put this stuff out. You get it on YouTube. But there's only 24 hours in a day. There's only so much of this stuff that any of us are doing that people are going to be able to listen to. And I don't say this myself from a position of feeling threatened by it because I think the lane that I'm in is a different one than these. Like the athlete lane is going to be people competing against each other in that lane what they are doing though is they messing up the game for guest booking like i will say that chris paul uh going on with d wade talking about how he almost got traded to miami hey man we over here dog you know we, we, we you could have told anybody in the world why are you over there telling somebody who already know the motherfucker they ain't known that for 10 years y'all been sitting on it man you could you could come holler at me you come holler at anybody else man i don't know you that good but your brother got my phone number like we could have talked about this Right here, they they killing that game. They're like, yo, I'm going to go sit down with my homeboy and we kind of like chat, basically, which has a value, right? And often lands in some very, very interesting places. But I still believe that there's an audience that wants, there's information that an audience wants that a professional is the one to draw it out, right? Like I used to do uh, Highly Questionable with Dan Levitard and he... It's often to my frustration, but very effectively could get that stuff out of people because he is a professional. And, you know, you figure out how to take these things into different places. And we got to make sure as an industry, because, look, I'm just all the way across the board. It's not about anything like really personal with me. But like Black Thought got that line, we lose a grip on what garbage means. Right. Like we got to maintain the standards of what content is and all of this stuff within this industry because it's going to be real easy for it to get out of hand because there's a zillion things that are out there. And I work for a company that does a lot of content with athletes, right? So I'm not judging them or anybody else when I say this. I'm just saying we got to make sure no matter what that we keep this stuff good because a lot of them cats want to be good. Like you work with people with us that want to be good at this. Yeah, they, they handle it like they do their basketball career or whatever. Like they want to get notes. They want to improve. They want to put in the time that they do their sport. Yeah, yeah. But, I, but I worry about podcasts as a medium, just generally speaking, because it is something that literally – anybody can do i'm not saying that like it's good i'm not saying that like it's bad <laughs> but you can pull up they got an app on whatever computer you got that's already built into that you can get a microphone plug it in anybody can do it and look and i know this because i know a bunch of y'all are doing it a bunch of y'all got podcasts that not one soul <laughs> in this world is listening to and that's okay I'm not saying that as a judgment. You want to do it. You feel it, right? You do a podcast, 10 people like it, and those 10 people really give you feedback, then do your, do your podcast for 10 people till it turns into 12, till it turns into 15, till it turns into 20, right? But literally, anybody can do it. And you're not really, like, there's ain't so much feedback. You're not going to, people ain't going to really throw tomatoes at you if it's bad, right? Everybody going, everybody going, oh, your friend's going to say it's good. Why not? <laughs> Right. Oh, yeah, man. I listened to it yesterday, man. That shit was jamming. Right. Like they're going to they're going to tell you no matter what that is good. And so I worry about anything that anybody feels like anybody can do because they're going to treat it like anybody can do it. And anybody can. But that don't mean that everybody should. Right. And so if you're going to get in it, I just hope across the board that people treat it with that level of care, because the one thing I feel like the athletes get frustrated with. With us as media and it's often fair is our inability to appreciate what they put into this and how important it is to them and what it takes to get it done and that these people who could never do it are the ones who get to critique them and go about it and then they came and just as a whole group just like yeah now we gonna do that shit to you right i mean that, that's exactly what it is and look i think the criticisms of what we do are absolutely fair 
but thinking that you can do it. Like, I wish, like when I used to do radio, I wish I could just show up to people's jobs, just put a microphone on the table and be like, go. Because it'd be like this, the first time any of us did radio, we all got the same story. Anybody that's ever taught a class in college got this same story. I walked in the room with an outline. 15 minutes later, I was out of stuff. <laughs> I had gone through every Roman numeral. I don't know how I went through it that fast, right? I said every word that I was going to say. Now you try to throw that off to questions, right? That's happening in radio. You start saying the phone number over and over again. Like, don't you want to call and talk to your new friend, Bo Jones? <laughs> don't you want to have a chat? You know? So in a time where nobody cares about whether or not anything is good, and it's just the idea of I can get it out here, I can get a budget for it, I can get a check, whatever it is. Because, like, the cast is coming up now, and somebody's like, yo, you can do a podcast? I mean, you can. Who's got time to listen to it? Like, you ask yourself, it's one thing when a podcast comes out and it's like a serial sort of thing. And it's like, yo, we got a little 10-episode thing for you to jump on. When's the last time you jumped on something new that was, like, regular and recurring? Because the thing you used to do was still there. Why would it go anywhere, right? What, what time are you getting in your life to work something else new in? And so it just looked like everybody can do it. Like, it's going to slow down. It's going to stop. It's not going to go the way that it had because it's just impossible for it. At some point, the money's going to run out. But as long as the game is just, if I can get somebody to write a check right fast, I can go out here and do something. And it just goes line after line after line after line, man. We're going to keep get, getting flooded with so much content that we have no ability to parse through it and find out what's good. And all these cats that's trying to get in it, they all going to get treated like they're the same because it's just like, oh, got another, got another athlete with a podcast. I hope a lot of them can break through by being good. I just fear that nobody's going to tell them to be good. And I know this because I've worked a lot of jobs where nobody was telling us to be good. Right. But we did it for a long time. We was pros at it. And then you go from there. But the last thing I want this to be, we came out of what I thought was like 10 years ago, a golden era of sports content where we had expanded the base of who the people were that were creating and a lot of really smart people who didn't have the certifications before, they then got democratized by the internet, then got in and they really wanted and made it happen. And then we got to that place where anybody could do it. And now everybody's doing it. And I'm just telling you now, that's never good. I wanted to ask you one question. We talked about it on, at lunch about how a lot of these pods, it, what people find out and how they know about is these short viral clips. Yes. How do you think that, like, because they don't see the full product, how do you think that's going to affect the way yeah. those pods or the industry kind of turns? Well, well, the question I've always had, because I don't know how other people behave. I just know how I do it. Those short clips never make me go look for the longer thing. You know what I mean? Like, when I see a short clip, I'm just content with the short clip. Now, I know there's some people that greatly value the ability to get the clip around, but I've never, I've never known the relationship between the clip. And for me, like, the longer thing is what I'm here for. Like, that is, that is what is a thing for me. I am at my core, a midday radio host, right? Like I want the room to stretch out on this topic, talk about all this stuff. That's where I stand, right? I don't know if the short clip is enough. Is it just going to be a game where we go sit around and record two hours until we can get something that we can chop up and then put together? I just don't feel like that serves the consumer. And I guess that's really where my question comes down to it is this, are, what are we doing to actually serve the audience, right? Are we doing anything to forget about simply amusing or occupying? Are we doing anything to like nourish the audiences that we have? Because look, man, they need us. They gonna need us real bad, real soon if they don't need us already. And that's my, the 30 is good as promo, but are people just stopping at the 30? Because I admit I do. Prize Picks is the most fun you can have by winning up to 25 times your money. And with the football season over, you can still win money with basketball and hockey. You just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projected stats, and place your entry. You can pick combo projections across multiple sports from the Specials League, a league created specifically for combo projections that includes two or more players from different sports or leagues. Prize Picks is really simple to play. You can make your picks and submit your entry in less than 60 seconds. And if you stick around for the end of the show, you'll get to hear some picks from our producer, Sean, that can either help you win or make you feel miserably. So make sure you go to prizepicks.com slash Bomani and use code Bomani for a first deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash Bomani. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Experiences are what people love the most about travel. 
If you know anything about me, you know I love to travel. I recently went to Iceland and got to experience all the country had to offer. And as someone who loves to travel and explore new places, Viator has been the perfect app for me. Viator is a website and app where you can book travel experiences like museum tours or restaurant experiences. They offer everything from simple tours to extreme adventures. With over 300,000 bookable experiences in 190 countries, there's something for everyone. Plus, Viator's travel experiences have millions of real traveler reviews, so you have the information you need to book the best activities for your trip. When you book a travel experience with Viator, there's always flexibility and support with free cancellation, payment options, and 24-7 service. Download the Viator app now and use code Viator10 for 10% off your first booking in the app. One app, over 300,000 travel experiences you'll remember. Do more with Viator. And let's be honest. Hydration is very important, and if you're not chugging water throughout the day or constantly having a glass of water next to you, are you really hydrating? Well, if you use Liquid IV, which has three times the electrolytes of leading sports drink, plus eight vitamins and nutrients for everyday wellness, you can hydrate even faster. Liquid IV is super easy to use. Just take a pre-measured packet and pour it into a glass of water, mix it up, and enjoy. You can take it at home before you start your day or take it with you to work or the gym. Plus, with their roster of flavors, which includes my favorite, the lemon lime, you can easily find the right flavor for you and your taste buds. However you hydrate, grab your Liquid IV Hydration Multiplier sugar-free in bulk nationwide at Costco or get 20% off your first order when you go to liquidiv.com and use code BOMANI at checkout. That's 20% off your first order when you shop Better Hydration today using promo code BOMANI at liquidiv.com. We know you can't be on top of all the news and information of the day. No need for the social media feeds. We got you. Now, if you haven't heard before we take a couple questions from the audience, we do a segment on the show called If You Hadn't Heard, where we hear from various writers, reporters in the industry, um, talking about various topics, mostly not in sports. Um, we have our first clip ready, if, if we can play that for the audience. Hey, I'm Gilad Edelman. I'm a senior editor at The Atlantic, and I wrote an article about why crypto just won't die. Last week, Bitcoin hit a new all-time high price of over $69,000 which makes approximately zero sense. Because didn't we all watch crypto die? Everybody remembers the crazy days of 2021 and 2022 when crypto was everywhere. People were talking about NFTs and bored apes. There was the Larry David Super Bowl commercial. You couldn't really escape it. Until it just went away. The bubble burst, people lost their money, and a lot of people in the industry ended up in handcuffs. It all kind of seemed like an embarrassing fad that was revealed to be kind of a scam and we would all get to stop thinking about it. So how can the crypto market be back and doing almost as well as ever? There are a couple of immediate causes. The federal government just approved a Bitcoin ETF, which will allow institutional players like BlackRock to start putting money into it. And Bitcoin is approaching a moment called a halving when the supply of new Bitcoins gets cut in half. So people always wanna buy more before that happens. But none of that really explains what's going on. Because first of all, Bitcoin isn't the only cryptocurrency that's doing well right now. The whole market is going on this insane rally. And second of all, crypto never really went away. Even after the bubble burst, the price never got that low. So the question remains, why are people buying this stuff? It's not as if it suddenly proved that it's got a great use case. More than 15 years after crypto was invented, nobody can agree on what it's actually for. And what I've come to realize is that that probably is why it just won't go away. Some people say Bitcoin is going to replace the dollar as the global reserve currency. Some people say uh, it's great for committing crimes. Some people say that no, Bitcoin's stupid, but other cryptocurrencies are great and we're going to build a new decentralized internet using them. And other people say, no, this is going to be great for artists because they can collect royalties because there's digital ownership, blah, 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 blah. And you can explain why any one of these theories doesn't hold up, but it's really hard to explain why all of them don't hold up at the same time. It's like a monster where when you cut one head off, three more grow back. So personally, I've stopped wondering when crypto is going to die. I think as long as the government continues to allow 
people to invest in this stuff and allows companies to sustain the ecosystem, people are going to keep investing in it. Just don't ask them to explain why. I'm getting visibly, physically angry. <laughs> I cannot believe I thought funny money had died. I thought that we had got people to realize, hey, man, I don't know if you realize this, man, but this is nothing but a big old Ponzi scheme. Like, what are you going to do? I'm going to take your money and I'm going to give you these three rocks. <laughs> well, what are these rocks for? For buying stuff. Well, why do I need to do that when I got money? Don't worry about that. The value of these rocks is going through the roof. Why is the value of these rocks going to go through, go through the roof? Because we're going to tweet about it. Watch. And it's happened over and over and over and over and over again. The truth is, crypto is not going to die, A, because we are a society poorer at discerning information, or a world, rather, is poorer at discerning information than ever. But the other part is, people need something to believe in. Why not believe in something that you think is going to get you rich, right? Because my thing with the crypto is not even about the use or whatever. I've always, I've said this a million times, it's just... So you tell me, what are the determinants of price? No one can ever do it. And if you can't tell me what the determinants of price are, then how do you feel comfortable investing in it? They just go ahead and believe in it. Now, I will say this. I did a documentary, somebody's doing some documentary on Bitcoin, and I was going in and they had me in as like a, a, a con voice with the oh, pro I guy. I didn't, I didn't know this. Yeah, but the problem was I was thinking of it as a crypto discussion and he was hyper focused on bitcoin and i will say he made a compelling case for the bitcoin itself he did but i'll also tell you this i done seen some souls have seen some rivers in the last three four <laughs> years about that crypto like like i mean we got two more our next one is about the retirement crisis i'm juliana kaplan i'm a senior reporter at business insider and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the retirement crisis that's looming and that's already very present for some Americans. I've been doing some data reporting and looking at just how retirees are doing. And what I've found is that just over half of Americans who are over the age of 65 are living on $30,000 or less, according to the Census Bureau's current population survey. And many people have incomes between $10,000 and just under $20,000. At the same time, there's a lot of Americans who are facing down not being able to maintain their lifestyles in their later years or who may find themselves unable to afford health care or housing especially. And that's something that is even more pronounced among retirees of color, contributing to just, again, greater inequality gaps. And that's going to end up costing not just these Americans who hope to retire and hope to retire with dignity, but it will also cost state economies and the federal government as well. So Pew is estimating that um, as more households with older Americans become financially vulnerable over the next 20 or so years, state governments are set to take a $1.3 trillion hit. And in reporting this, I've just heard from hundreds of seniors who say that this is their situation, they're worried they're never going to be able to retire, or they've had to come out of retirement, what we call unretirement. And it's something that's really dire and something politicians are taking a real hard look at. Hey, man, if the Zoomers hate the boomers now, wait till the boomers won't quit their jobs. <laughs> wait, till you, wait till your young ass can't get no job because granny's still out there working at Walmart. You wish you could weigh those people in there. You wish you, you, wish you was the one in there letting them in. But look, I think about this. I hadn't thought about this. As I heard that, I got a movie script idea. All those factors get laid out. Somebody goes through that and then four old people start robbing banks. They're going a robbery spree. Don't say it too loud here. People might actually steal that. Oh, story. no, they can think they can steal. I got this on tape. That counts as some intellectual <laughs> property. Like, you think about that. It's set it off remake. Except it's, I saw, I think Marla Gibbs is still in the league. Uh, we can get her in there. Who else can we get out there? Somebody... Damn, that's the only old black person I can think of right now, <laughs> unfortunately. That's a D.L. Warwick. She on Twitter. I can see her jacking somebody up. Right. We're going to get us a couple more. Some dude over there counting on his fingers. I hate he's so far away that I can't rob his brain for the idea of somebody else. But we're going to have this. This is going to be the old people set it off. Yeah. Actually, I mean, set it off came out so long ago that we could probably like Just we could use the original cast. I don't want to be offensive. But uh, <laughs> like, hey, look, I've been, call I've been getting called old all weekend and I'm only 43. That's all I'm saying. We can put them in makeup. It'd be like, what's the name of the Golden Girl? She was like the youngest one. She wasn't really old. 
That's how I dug myself out of that hole. What's next? Hi, I'm Ross Anderson, a staff writer at The Atlantic. I recently wrote a feature called How First Contact with Whale Civilization Could Unfold. It's about a $30 million effort to decode sperm whale language led by some of the best AI researchers in the world. Sperm whales are wondrous. They rank among the deepest diving whales, and they organize themselves into clans of up to 10,000 animals. If a large language model, like the one that powers ChatGPT, was able to decode the whale's clicking sounds, I wanted to know, how would we actually go about talking to them? How would we even approach them in the water? We would probably want to send a woman, because sperm whale culture is matrilineal. As she got close, the whales would start sending echolocation beams through her body. To figure out what she could say first, to put the whales at ease, and where the conversation might go from there, I talked to field scientists who specialize in whales, paleontologists, professors of animal rights law, linguists, and philosophers, and their answers blew my mind. He gave us a little cliffhanger of, you got to read the article to get the answers, but basically, apparently we can basically talk to whales now. I got to say, thank you for filling it in, because part of the fun for this is I find out about the article when we play it. I don't actually read it. I try to go along with this the same way, and here he was thinking he had a gimmick for us. Thanks for nothing. Yeah, apparently we can talk to whales, and that'll lead to us being able to talk to potentially alien civilizations, that, maybe? That was that was the place that made me pick this, is he was like, we're going to use chat GPT to talk to aliens, and I got news for you. If it gets to the point that we need to talk to the aliens, it's too late. <laughs> There's nothing to discuss. Like, all we need to do is figure out how to say please in whatever language they speak. But if it gets to that point where we talk with the, where we done. need to talk to the aliens, what are we going to do against the aliens? Um, we can open it up for, we'll take three questions from the audience. If anyone wants to raise your hand, we can get a mic over to you. I see one hand right there. So you're a fan of Outcast, I'm a fan of Outcast. Yes. How has it influenced the way that you do what you do? All right, so if we're getting like technically, like musically nerdy about it, the thing about Outcast that always hits me is that, like I did a, uh, this, you know, not to sound like that guy, but I did a TED Talk once. Um, <laughs> but the title of it was The Freedom of Structure, and the notion of it was that if you do what you're supposed to do, you can do whatever you want to do after that, right? So like lock in on what's, imp lock in on what's necessary, and then from there, you can kind of have the freedom to roam. And if you think about the Outcast catalog, that's really kind of what the notion is. We're going to give you a hook, we're going to give you a beat, and then from there, we're going to take you on a ride. But if I lock you in on the things that you need, right? If I catch that beat, I got a lot more flexibility and rhythm to take you on that ride. Like, that is a big part of it. Uh, number two, and I think that this is a very, very important one is, you know, I'm a proud Southern man, and by and large, y'all be treating, not y'all, not you, but you know, they be treating us bad and acting as though that we are lesser in various ways, and them country motherfuckers is out there like, no, sir. <laughs> Eric, everybody got like, in the end, the South won, man. Like, everything that everybody said about us, at least in that music game, it came back around and we won. That is the big one. Like, it went from the center of hip-hop being New York to the center of hip-hop being Atlanta. And that starts with OutKast, period. You mentioned uh, sports content growing, like, so much. Do you think it's growing, like, more than just content? Because I feel like we're inundated with content in general, like, whether yeah. it be movies, TV, sports news i mean it's harder to we're already like swimming like trying to find the the good stuff yeah no i i think that it's happening like i guess i have a more particular concern with sports because that's kind of the world that i'm in but no you are correct like all this stuff is going and i don't know who's watching this to be perfectly honest like when i did the show on hbo i have no idea how many people watched any of that like i wasn't really getting the numbers on that but i would go on like max and look at all the apps even looking at my my show and i'm like so how many people are actually looking at this being like yeah this is what i'm gonna do there's a zillion things up there. Like, something that's interesting I think about is, um, I forget when this was many years ago, but I remember reading something about McDonald's, that McDonald's keeps adding all this stuff to the menu, but some disproportionate amount of the orders are still Big Macs, Quarter Pounders, Chicken McNuggets. Like, that's still, like, some huge piece of the pie, but they just keep throwing all this other stuff out there. How many people are ordering all this stuff that's on the menu? Like, how many people are really going and checking this? How much money are people making getting all this stuff? But, yeah, people are just throwing all this stuff out here, and we don't have any way truly... Like, how do you, how do you decide what you're going to check? 
how do you decide what you're going to watch? It's like the media can't even keep up to curate and review all the stuff to give you an idea of what you're supposed to do. I got no idea how people are supposed to do this. I, I was going to ask you, how do you pick something to watch? Because I know, you know, you're a big music guy, but if you yeah. are I'm deciding not, to watch a movie or TV, what, how does that get through your yeah. like, firewall? I'm not like I'm the wrong person to ask because I'm not that much of a watcher, but I go really on personal recommendation. Like somebody I know and trust. But I have access. I have access to a different set of people to tell me about what to check out than most people do. You know, like I don't know how regular people see. There we go again. I don't know. But, but I mean, but for real, though, like, I don't know the words, but you know what I mean. Right. Like, like, hey, look, look here. You, you might have studio heads who tell you, oh, you might want to go check this out. Hey, I don't want to be the one to act like I'm the only person that does that. Right. But I don't know who's the curating figure supposed to be for the median person to be like, yo, this is something you're going to check. And I think just as important. Is there a level of trust from the audience for that curator? Right? Because that's the thing about it. People don't like this idea of gatekeeping. Man, somebody got to keep the gate. Like, people say they don't like gatekeeping. I'm like, who in the hell left the gate open? Uh, before I let you do your outro, Bo, uh, let's just want to thank the audience for their questions. And thank you to the... Uh, Yo, well, hold on. Hold on. Let's thank the audience yeah. for their attendance. Yes. Because you certainly do not have to do that. I greatly appreciate it. I'm looking at all these motherfuckers over here that ain't paying me no attention. Like, what are they doing? Like, they're over here playing cornhole. They, there's literally not a goddamn thing going on over here. I'm over here in the loudest hoodie that I got. You know you see me. Every single one of you sees me. Hey! <laughs> Uh, before we wrap, I want to thank Elad Edelman at The Atlantic for his article on why crypto won't die, Juliana Kaplan at Business Insider for her article on the retirement crisis, and Ross Anderson, a staff writer at The Atlantic, for how we can talk to uh, the whale civilizations. All right. And ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us here on The Right Time. We do this three times a week. This is Sean Yu. He handles everything behind the scenes. I thank you, sir. Now remember, follow the right time. Subscribe, like, rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars, I'm inclined to believe. You are a hater, and we will talk to you guys in a couple of days. Take it easy. Take it easy.